Billions of people died in Attack on Titan. Hundreds have been killed in Demon Slayer, but surprisingly, only a mere 80 people have died in One Piece. And so in this video, we will explain every single character that has been killed in the story, starting with the most game-changing death in the story so far, the execution of the former Pirate King, Goldie Roger. Isn't that right, Gojo? Now, Roger was killed by these world government executioners who can now actually claim the title of killing the strongest pirate to ever live. However, this monumentous event occurred in the very first page of the story after Roger had already found the legendary island called Love Tale. But during his journey, he became deathly ill, so he decided to turn himself into the Marines. He did so in order to inspire the next generation of pirates to find the legendary treasure and change the world. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah. Of course, this is by far the only death in chapter one, thanks Kojo, and it's kind of crazy that the very first chapter of One Piece is also one of the bloodiest, because we also have the death of the captain of the mountain bandits. Now, after he kidnapped Luffy like this and clashed with Shanks, he took Luffy out to sea where he was then eaten by a giant sea monster. And interestingly enough, this is actually the only time we've seen a named character in One Piece being killed by a vicious sea creature. Yeah, it is kind of weird because the world is filled with these massive monsters. But even before this, this random mountain bandit was also shot in the head by Shanks' crewmate Lucky Rook. However, after these initial three deaths in the very first chapter, we have to actually wait almost two entire years until the next death in the story. That's until in chapter 75, we meet the first of many random, unfortunate characters to simply be in the wrong place at the wrong time in One Piece. In this case, this random marine Commodore who actually has the hilarious name Pudding Pudding. Nice. Now he's actually come to save Nami's hometown from this ruthless group of fishermen. However, Arlong's henchmen sink the marine vessel before even landing on the island and this sends Pudding Pudding and his marines to a early watery grave. Maybe next time they should wait until they're on land to actually challenge a group of fishermen. So do make sure to keep watching to see all the times that the straw hats actually ended up killing people. And in fact, Zoro is next on this list. Jumping ahead a few more years, and in chapter 190, we learn that Zoro actually killed the former Mr. Seven, a special agent working for the Warlord Crocodile sometime before the story began. Now, apparently, this Mr. Seven tried to forcefully recruit Zoro into the organization, but clearly it didn't end that well. But that's not even the only one of Crocodile's subordinates to be killed, as Mr. Eleven was shot dead by a supposed ally, Mr. Mellow, in chapter 159. Now, staying in the sandy wastes of Alabasta, these guys died by their own hands while trying to take down the Warlord Crocodile. We're talking about these guards right here, and they willingly drank this deadly hero water. And I, you might ask, why? Well, it does give you a ridiculous boost in strength, but only lasting for a few minutes before its effect turned deadly for its user. And their sacrifice just goes to show how truly desperate they were to take down the Warlord. And these are the only official deaths in Alabasta, actually, except for any of the random characters who died in the massive fighting during the Civil War. Looking at you, pal. And this already leads us to the absolute largest named character to die in One Piece, which is this giant snake, Kasigami, which was worshipped by the ancient people of Jaya. However, that all changed when the snake god had its head cut off by the explorer Nolan in chapter 287. Now, Nolan did this to save this woman here from being sacrificed, and while this event initially caused much conflict, eventually Nolan became great friends with the tribe. However, maybe this giant snake was actually some kind of god because karma came back just a while later to bite Nolan when he was executed by his own kingdom. Now, this was because he couldn't find the famous city of gold a second time, but this was of course not his fault since the golden city of Shandora was literally shot into the sky. But don't tell that to this greedy king right here. Instead, we're moving on from one slimy killer to another, so let's jump ahead to six volumes to chapter 356. Now, during this chapter, the legendary shipwright Tom was taken away and supposedly executed by Spandam, one of the most hated characters in One Piece. Now this was all a setup after Spandam had used young Frankie's weapon to frame Tom. And so even though it wasn't Tom's fault, he accepted the punishment to save his beloved apprentices. But yeah, we really do hate this guy. So please Robin, go ahead, smack him around a little bit more for us. Or another one. Or another 
another one. Yeah, that's that's pretty good. Okay. Well, in fact, we could wipe out Spandam's whole family. The One Piece world would probably be a whole lot better off because Spandam's father, Spandine, was the main government agent who brought mass destruction to the scholarly island of Ohara, which on this channel, we of course take very personal. While this is clearly one of the saddest moments in the story, it is not nearly as significant as the next death on this list. Because this man right here is called Thatch, the second division commander of the Whitebeard Pirates, or at least he was until he found the darkness Logia Devil Fruit and was instantly killed by Marshal D. Teach. And at this point, Blackbeard, who was also part of Whitebeard's crew, had been searching for this fruit for 26 years. In fact, he only joined Whitebeard because he thought that it was his best chance at finding this one super rare and special fruit. So Blackbeard literally stabbed Thatch in the back and left the Whitebeard pirates for good. And while Thatch himself is not super important, important, his death kicked off many of the most important plot lines in the entire story. Oh, why you ask? Well, because after Blackbeard betrayed the crew, Ace set out to hunt down the traitor for revenge. And that all eventually, of course, led to Ace's capture and the whole war at Marineford. Plus, this betrayal won Blackbeard his famous devil fruit, which is super game-changing because it is literally the most mysterious power and has helped him quickly become an emperor of the sea himself. Which now already takes us to Thriller bark where we met this zombie pirate named Captain John. And while he is already dead when we meet him here, well that's kind of an odd statement, however moving on, we later learned in a question corner that this former member of the Rocks Pirates was actually killed by his own crew because he refused to share his treasure. And if you think that any of these betrayals are downright disgusting, then make sure to keep watching because it is nothing compared to the next killers on this list. Because in Saba Odi, we meet these in humanly cruel world nobles. And in the space of just three chapters, we see how truly awful these spacesuit wearing celestial dragons truly are. They needlessly kill not only one, but two innocent people as if they were just being bugs. And while we only see these two particular deaths, we can basically assume that deaths like that are very common for anyone unfortunate enough to encounter the Celestial Dragons. Seriously, these dudes here are twisted in all the worst ways. However, now leaving behind Saba Odi, our next death is a really big one, literally. This massive giant, Ors Jr., was a longtime friend of Ace who was taken out during the war at Marineford. And while it was never officially confirmed that he was dead, he had his whole leg sliced off by Doflamingo and he was bombarded by attacks from countless marines. Plus, we've never seen him again anywhere in the story, so I just assume that he is dead, along with lots and lots and lots of other random marines and pirates during this epic war. But on top of that, of course, Marineford also gave us the single most impactful death for Luffy in the entire story, and that's because the whole point of the war at Marineford was to save Luffy's blood brother Ace, who was sentenced to execution by the world government after Blackbeard had turned him in. And while Luffy eventually did free him, the brothers could not escape the wrath of the Marine Admiral Akainu, who gave us one of the most soul-crushing moments in the entire story. Like, this moment broke Luffy both physically and mentally, and I can still remember the deep sadness that I felt seeing that moment for the very first time. And Luffy cannot process his brother's death either, and goes into this mindless coma which almost costs him his life and will to keep going. However, eventually this loss makes him realize that he was not strong enough to protect his friends and not taking things quite seriously enough also, so he decided to train for two years and become a better captain. And while this war showed us some of the most insanely overpowered fighters in the story, none of them compared to the single most deadly force in all of One Piece. That's right, I'm talking about stairs. Don't believe me? Well, just remember that these stairs right here easily took out Zoro's childhood friend Kuina, who literally defeated Zoro 2001 times. If that's not the definition of a monstrous force of nature, then I do not know what is. However, an easy way to 
protect yourself from the deadly stare monster is by subscribing to this channel. I'm not sure if that makes sense. I guess it makes you stare proof. Anyways, after Blackbeard's complete betrayal at Marineford, we get another example of crew on crew violence during the A Sabo and Luffy flashback. That's because this guy who's called Pochemi was killed by his own captain, Blue Jam, for failing to beat up a young ace and Sabo. And speaking of Blue Jam, I don't know about you, but I could really go for my own jam sandwich right now as we get into the even deadlier second half of the story. Because after the two year time skip and a month long break in real life, we now move ahead to Fishman Islands. Because that's where in chapter 623, the chattiest of all the fishmen, Fisher Tiger, was killed by Marines for simply returning this lost child to her home. And that death meant that Fishman continued to hate humans for generations. However, this hatred had very serious consequences later on because the human hating Fishman Hody Jones actually assassinated the Fishman Queen Orohime because of her ideals about humans and Fishmans living together in peace. And soon after the Fishman Queen's death, we learned about the death of the most mysterious character in the entire story. Because when Robin reads this poneglyph at the bottom of the ocean, she learns about a character named Joy Boy. Now, as far as we can tell, this happily named figure was the leader of the legendary Ancient Kingdom. And while we do not know exactly what happened, we can assume that he was killed during the final battle with the 20 kingdoms that ultimately formed the world government. And while we've learned a little bit more about Joy Boy during the recent arcs, which I covered in depth in a previous video, this is one death that we absolutely will still have to learn more about before the end of the story. On the other hand, one character that we certainly won't be hearing from again is Virgo. Now, this man was posing as a marine while actually working undercover for Doflamingo. However, after being stuck in the railing of a laboratory by Trafalgar Law, Virgo then died in a massive explosion that rocked the entire laboratory on Punk Hazard. So, Congratulations, you food-loving man, because you're the very first named character to die in the new world. Congratulations. However, don't worry, Virgo was quickly joined by this Snow Logia fruit user called Monet, who was seconds away from blowing up the entire island with an even bigger explosion. Unfortunately for her, she was then killed when Caesar Clown stabbed her heart. By accident, but still. Because little did Caesar Clown know that Law had actually tricked him, and so he actually killed his own subordinate instead of the Marine Admiral Smoker. But as hard as it is to watch someone accidentally kill their friend, it is nothing Thing compared to the tear-jerking, sickening sadness of loss flashback. I mean, first, we learned that basically Law's entire home island, including Law's sister Lamy, were wiped out by neighboring countries because of a misunderstanding about their disease. And then on top of that, during chapter 767, this evil young Doflamingo became so disgusted by his own father for taking away their status as celestial dragons, so young Dofi shoots Doflamingo homing himself while his brother cries in his father's arms. Holy damn, what a horrible little monster young Dofi already was. And in the very same chapter, we get the heartbreaking conclusion to Law's flashback as well. Because here we see Doflamingo's brother, Corazon, steal the Ope Ope no Mi to save Law from his disease. Now he stole this fruit from Diaz Barrels, a pirate who wanted to sell the fruit to the world government. And this turned out kind of poor for Barrels. I mean, how couldn't it with a name like that, I guess? But of course, Doflamingo later killed Barrels because he did want the fruit for himself. And yet, Doflamingo was not done yet with his killing spree because in the same chapter, he then executes his own brother, Corazon. And this is honestly one of the saddest moments in the story. Corazon fights to stay alive to hide Law's frantic cries from Doflamingo, and he holds on just enough to his life force for Law being able to escape. Now, of course, at least in the end, Law does get his revenge during the events of the Dressrosa arc. But while Doflamingo is our current leading killer with three, we jump ahead nearly two years to Whole Cake Island, where Big Mom easily takes the cake as the deadliest individual in One Piece at this point. That's because we learn in a flashback from chapter 850 that Big Mom killed Zeppo, the brother of everyone's favorite polar bear Beppo. In that chapter, we learned that she stole his entire lifespan as punishment for trying to steal her road poneglyph. And these deaths just continued at the tea party when Katakuri killed this guy, Jigra, for attempting to break 
break into the invitation only party. And then 10 chapters after those horrifying deaths, we get one of the most heroic sacrifices in the story. Because as the Straw Hats are attempting to escape from Big Mom's territory and her army, their ship is trapped by Perospero's sticky candy. So this leopard mink called Pedro sacrifices himself by blowing up the candy trap with a ton of dynamite. And while Pedro's choice did allow the crew to escape, it was devastating for their emotions. Please, Oda, don't ruin his sacrifice by bringing him back to life, like he sometimes likes to do. And the next death is one that Sanji would probably be happy to hear. And that's because this lion looking guy who ate the invisibility fruit that Sanji really wanted, Absalom, was killed by someone from the Blackbeard Pirates. But it's not all good news for Sanji who desperately wanted it because now Shiryu has already eaten that fruit and is using it to great effects. Which now actually takes us all the way to Wano where we have the most named character deaths of any arc in the entire story so far. And it all starts off with this smiling little man called Yasuie. Now, he was actually the former daimyo who became the hero of the leftover town until he was then caught stealing from the flower capital. And this set up his execution in chapter 942 when he reveals his true identity and gives an inspiring speech to the crowd that sends the shogun Orochi and his men into a frenzy and they end up killing Yasuie immediately. However, the porcupine haired man is not the only daimyo who meets their end during the Wano arc. In fact, these three former daimyos called Uzuki Tempura, Fugetsu Umusubi, and Zoro's great uncle Shimotsuki Oshimaru were all killed by Kaido and his crew many years before the start of the Wano arc. But of course, it's not just former samurai on Kaido's hit list, because the emperor even killed one or possibly two of his allies. This here is Kurozumi Higurashi, the previous user of the clone fruit and her partner, Kurozumi Sinimaru, who was the previous user of the barrier fruit. Now, it was confirmed in chapter 972 that Kaido actually killed Higurashi for interfering with his fight with Kozuki Oden, and while we don't know for sure, we can assume that Sinimaru also died around this time since we never see him again, but his devil fruit does pop up again. And chapter 972 is also the spectacular climax of Oden's execution. Now, you might remember that he heroically survived in a boiling pot of hot oil for an entire hour. And because of his super impressive feat, Odin's retainers lived to carry on his will. Now unfortunately, Odin himself was basically dead at this point and Kaido finished the job with a bullet to the head. So in case you're keeping track, that's now six for Kaido. And then just one chapter later, Odin's wife Toki delivered a chilling prophecy that would go on to haunt Orochi for 20 years. However, the time fruit user was then shot and killed by Kaido's forces just as she finished her majestic speech. And I'm actually just realizing that Oda really loves killing characters right after they say like some epic sort of line. Worth it though. And this all takes us now to the epic conclusion of the battle on Onigashima. But before we get there, let's go over some honorable mention killers who we still haven't yet discussed in the story. First, we have Poison, which actually wiped out Brook's former Captain Yorkie and his entire crew. And then Disease also claimed the life of Senior Pink's child and wife Gimlet and Russian. And of course, it's at this point I'd also like to mention Rox de Zebek. Now, the former fleet admiral Zengoku tells us that this legendary pirate was killed during the infamous Battle of God Valley. And while this may be true and Rox could actually be dead, I find it entirely possible that he may still be alive somewhere in the One Piece world, so we're not quite counting him here. However, the greatest honorable mention killer of all is, of course, Oda Sensei himself, the author who loves to kill a particular group of characters quite suspiciously. And who might this group of of unfortunate characters be, you ask? Well, pretty much anyone in a flashback. Well, yes, but no, not that one. It's actually mothers. That's right. There are almost no significant mothers still alive in the entire story, and that's because Oda thinks that if all the mothers were still alive, they would probably stop their kids from becoming pirates. So as a result, Oda usually kills them off in some tragic way that leaves a lasting impression on their children. For example, there was Usopp's mom, Bankina, who died from illness. 
Nami's adoptive mother, Belmare, who was killed by Arlong, Robin's mom, Nico Olbia, who died in the flames of Ohara, Sanji's mom, Min Smoke Sora, who also died from illness, Portgas D. Rouge, who died from childbirth while carrying Ace, Rebecca's mom, Scarlet, who was also killed by Doflamingo's right hand, Mem Diamante, and that's not even including others that we've already mentioned, like Otohime, who was the mother of the mermaid princess, and Toki, who gave birth to Momo and Hiyori, or Zoro's mother, who also died from illness, though we've never actually met her in the main story. But now let's dive right back into the fiery conclusion of Wano, where in chapter 1008, we have the very first of Odin's red scabbards to meet their end. And that is Ashura Doji, who was a mountain gang boss until Odin came and tamed the wild lands of Wano. And after the scabbards failed to defeat Kaido, they were confronted by a twisted version of their former master. Ashura Doji realizes that this is actually another clone created by their former ally Kanjuro, and with his very last act, he tackles the false Odin, and together they fall into a fiery explosion. And while we've seen characters survive damage like this before, it was later on then confirmed that he actually did in fact die here. But speaking of Kanjuro, this traitor died in a very similar blaze of glory. After suffering many fatal wounds when battling the red scabbard Kinemon, Kanjuro crawled back to Orochi's feet. Orochi then ordered him to create this massive blob of hateful flames to consume Kaido's entire castle and everyone in it. And after creating it, Kanjuro collapsed and died. However, luckily, his master would also not survive that much longer. Now, Orochi seemed to die many times during the raid on Onigashima, like when Kaido cut off his head or when the scabbards took out many of his snake heads. However, annoyingly enough, he always kind of reappeared because of the special abilities of his mythical zone devil fruit, the Yamato no Orochi. And that's because his fruit allowed him to have eight lives along with his eight snake-like heads. But by the time that we see him in chapter 1048, he has already had seven of his heads already taken out. And Orochi is then confronted by another of the red scabbards, Denjiro. And it is fitting that Denjiro would be the one that deals the final blow here because he suffered for years secretly blotting Orochi's downfall for over 20 years. But with a last slash of his sword, Denjiro finally slays the twisted Shogun, bringing Odin's revenge after 20 long years of suffering. And so good riddance to the probably most annoyingly voiced character in an entire anime. Unfortunately, there isn't a complete happy ending here for the scabbard stove. Now with Ashura Doji already dead, the pistol-wielding Izu is battling against agents of the world government ZP0 agency, and already heavily damaged, Izu clashes with this guy right here one last time, and the pair deal fatal blows to each other. Just like with Ashura Doji, Izu's death was also later on confirmed, leaving a bittersweet taste to the end of the war. But since their famous battle cry, Sunachi, basically means that they will give their all to achieve victory, I think that they will consider it a sacrifice worth the freedom of their country after over 20 years of oppression under Kaido. But speaking of the big bad man himself, it brings us to the climax of the war on Onigashima and two more really important deaths of the arc. Or um, at least possible deaths. You see, in chapter 1040, the tag team duo of Law and Captain Kid fully unleashed their awakened devil fruit powers to defeat Big Mom. First, Law's silencing bubble cancelled out Big Mom's soul powers, and then Kid's super overpowered railgun forces the helpless Big Mom out of the castle and into a massive hole. And unfortunately, this pit leads directly into a pool of volcanic lava deep beneath the surface of Wano. And if literal molten lava is not enough to kill Big Mom, then I truly do not know if she can be killed at all in the story. But for now, we are led to believe that she is dead since much time has passed and she still has not reappeared. And the same can be said for the strongest creature in the world, Kaido. As the truly epic clash atop the skull dome comes to its end, Kaido used his insanely massive fire dragon form that towered over the island itself. And with this mind-boggling massive punch, he then crushed Kaido all the way down into the same underground lava pool as Big Mom, which led to a giant volcanic eruption as Luffy was declared the victor of the battle. And while this surely was a truly amazing moment in the story, we have to give the same disclaimers for Kaido's death as we did for Big Mom's, because Kaido might have somehow survived this titanic explosion but for now, we're meant to believe that the two emperors of the sea are well and truly dead. And so, after four years in the most deadly arc to date, the story moved on to an even more shocking death, or should I say, deaths that anyone could imagine. Because first, in chapter 1054, it's confirmed that Nefatari Cobra, who's the father of Vivi and the king of Alabasta, was killed during the meeting of the world government's rulers after he saw the ruler of the world, Emu. And this is a truly game-changing death, since it was blamed on 
on Luffy's blood brother Sabo. And while no one really believes that it was Sabo, it is still hugely important because not only was Cobra secretly one of Luffy's allies, but he was also one of the few actual, quote unquote, good kings in the story. And so if anyone was gonna try to change the government for good, it was going to be him. So with him dead, this means that we may be getting an even more Sinister World government than we had so far in the story. Which then leads us directly to the destruction of an entire island. Because in an unthinkable display of power, either the Five Elders or Emu, the secret ruler of the world, unleashed this massive blast of laser beams that took out the entire kingdom of Lulucia. This includes the king and the princess, and this event in chapter 1060 brings to light the truly terrifying powers of the world government. They simply decided that this kingdom was going to be erased, and this mysterious weapon of destruction was able to make it a reality within seconds. Now, we do not know if this is a devil fruit power or simply an ancient weapon, but either way, this is destruction on a scale way bigger than anything that we have ever seen in the story, which makes me wonder if this is how God Valley was also erased from the map. Which now takes us to the arc called Egghead Island, where on the island we are actually giving a genuine murder mystery for the very first time in the story. Now this mystery came to an epic conclusion in chapter 1077, when Shaka, the Vegapunk satellite who represents logic, was shot in the head by the traitor of Egghead Island. And while we still don't truly know if Shaka is actually dead, the traitor, who turned out to be York, who is the Vegapunk satellite representing greed, certainly acted like he was out of the picture for good. And then just two chapters later, we get the most undeniably badass one-shot KO in the entire story, courtesy of the Yonko Red Hair Shanks. You see, with Captain Kid pulling up on Elbaf and about to take out Shanks' entire fleet, Shanks then decides to deliver a single godly Conqueror's hockey-infused slash that takes out Kid and almost all of his crew. And right after, this assault was then followed up by an even more massive dual sword blast from the giants Dorian Bragi, which then sent Kit and his entire crew sinking to the bottom of the sea. And while we don't know yet for sure again if Kit will survive this ordeal, the incredible hype around this feat leads me to believe that he might actually be dead for good here. But as devastating a blow as this was to Kit fans everywhere, it is not the first time that Kit has been beaten down. In fact, did you know that he was actually beaten up by his very first lover? Or did you know that Shanks might have been born on God Valley? Well, if you want to know more about every single tragic, epic, and heartwarming backstory in One Piece, you can watch that video right here. Thanks for watching, and I see you in the next one.